Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce David Leopold. I um, met David in 1997 or 8 when I was a postdoc at the MPI, uh, and we became good friends. And um, I mean, I'll tell you the usual stuff. So he went to Duke, majored in biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's funny. That's what you ended up doing, kind of. Yeah, okay, anyway. <laughs> um, and then was a grad student at Baylor with Nikos Logothetis, a postdoc at the MPI in Tübingen uh, with Nikos again. And since 2002, he has been the director of the, I'll call it the Monkey Neuroimaging Lab, but it has a different name. Uh, and David's just um, a wonderful person. He's not your typical sort of careerist hack that you often see. Uh, He's uh, in a really deep human being who's fat. He's probably the kid who went to the museum and looked at the dinosaurs and remembered the whole taxonomy and knew all the names and subspecies and, you know, probably, is that true? Were you that kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. I, I tried. I faked it. <laughs> yeah, and so now it expresses itself. I'll be out walk. well, you know, like tomorrow we're going to go hiking, and he'll hear something and he'll say, oh, yeah, that's the yellow-throated honeysuckle sapsucker subspecies, blah, 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 and I'll be like... <laughs> I, you know, like, I wouldn't know any difference. Anyway, um, so he's, uh, he's basically a lover of s nature, and that is why he's a scientist, and uh, that's the best kind. Okay, welcome David Leopold, who will talk about uh, <laughs> uh, uh, face patches, and it's called Investigating the Nature of High-Level Visual Specialization in the Primate Brain, but it's really about face patches. All right. All right? Okay. <laughs> During introductions, you're always trying to think of how you can make a link from the introduction. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a nature lover, so that's great. Um, so I am going to talk about um, this curiosity, which is related to uh, you know a curiosity about nature, uh, having to do with when we talk about, um, for lack of a better term, high-level specializations in the brain. So the the way that we know, for example, that the human brain has patches that are dedicated for the processing of faces and bodies and things like that. Um, how can we go a step further beyond just stating their existence? Can we get a little bit deeper into what they are? And this is, we have several fronts in my lab that are sort of um, related to this, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them. One of them is more theoretical. It's like uh, considering evolution and development and how, you know, how did these specializations come about? Maybe that gives us some idea about uh, what their essence is. Um, another is um, kind of traditional electrophysiological recordings and face patches, and I'll talk about some of that today. And another is related to natural vision. If we learn some properties uh, under more conventional conditions, what uh, capacity does that give us to predict how neurons and, and areas will respond under more natural conditions? So <clears throat> primates um, are unusual among mammals in that they're extremely dedicated to the use of vision for aspects of social behavior beyond what, what most mammals are. Um, and a lot of this can be ascribed to a specialization in the retina itself. So the high acuity vision of the fovea within the primate means if you have a 40 or 50 cycles per degree acuity at the center of your vision, you can make some judgments about, for example, other animals that are 10 meters away that are quite subtle. And primates spend a lot of time looking at each other and judging whether what the, relation, the nature of the relationship is between monkey A and monkey B, or what's going to happen next, things like that. That's what we spend a lot of time doing. And a lot of that is um, facilitated uh, by our unusually uh, high-resolution fovea. The, um, an another factor that comes a little bit into play relates to how we select our mates, we being primates, um, and we select our mates based on vision as well. And this has been linked, for example, to the uh, routine trichromacy, for example, in, in old-world primates, where the capacity to see different shades of red, the perfusion of tissue in the rump and the face uh, allows one to select um, based upon dominance or uh, sexual ornaments and things like that in the primate domain. So, and that uh, commitment to vision for that purpose is also correlated with a decline in these special olfactory receptor genes uh, with, for which primates are, are quite poor in our olfacts. Okay, so we combine that specialization with the more general mammalian uses of vision to end up in a very you know, dramatic situation sometimes where primates have to make quick social decisions based upon cues, visual cues often, and they have to respond correctly. So in order to support this kind of behavior, we have to have 
analyzers of different sorts. We have to be able to link them to contextual information about the structure of the society that we live in, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm interested in how the specializations within the brain help us with these very real uh, primate problems. Now linking that to what's been done and what's known about, uh, for example, le selectivity within the brain, um, it kind of puts us in the domain of faces. So a lot of what I'll be talking about today um, is related to face patches and things that are more familiar. Um, and, but you'll, you'll see throughout that I'm, I'm trying to go in somewhat new directions to try to see whether we can uh, make more general statements about um, a visual specialization. So we know from um, a lot of work, uh, a lot of work from uh, like Nancy Kenwisher, who mapped out face uh, selective areas in the human and, and other types of uh, areas, and more recently Doris Chow together with Wienrich Freivald, who used fMRI to really um, give us some nice anchor points within the ventral uh, pathway of the hack monkey's brain, uh, a countable number of named face patches, so posterior, middle, anterior, uh, fundus, um, medial, lateral, uh, that we can find pretty routinely in different labs and different monkeys that are coming about if we just ask the question, where do voxels in the monkey brain respond more to faces than to other object categories? Okay, um, and uh, there's been a lot of effort, there's a lot of effort going on right now to try to say, okay, if there are six or seven face patches, then how, why are there so many, how are they distributed, um, what are the response properties? And so people like Wienrich Feivald and colleagues go in with electrodes and they say, well, uh, one face patch, whoops, one face patch responds a bit more to some features and others to another. And there seems to be emerging the notion that there is something like a face patch hierarchy or maybe parallel hierarchies for the processing of different facial attributes, although this is work that is, is really underway right now. Another important question, I think, for all of us is to try to understand, okay, what is the link to the human brain? We know features about the macaque brain and features about the human brain, but it's surprisingly difficult to understand what the relation is between these, um, uh, superficially at least, looking uh, uh, similarities. Um, and that's also ongoing work, and our own um, little contribution to that uh, is in the marmoset where we showed in collaboration with Afonso Silva that um, if you just basically have the marmoset, awake marmoset, looking at uh, images of faces and other objects, you do the same basic kind of experiment, you see again, at least at a superficial level, face patches that have the same distribution. And so we're all together now trying to figure out what corresponds to what in uh, the different species. But that's not what I'm going to talk about now, uh, other than just to point out that there seems to be this organization wherever we look, in primates at least. Um, I'm going to focus instead on uh, two main areas, mostly on this one face patch here called the anterior fundus face patch, AF, which is one of the face patches that uh, neither Wienrich nor Doris have spent a lot of time um, systematically investigating, so it's a bit open to look at neural response properties. Um, and I'll also talk about some old and new work where we're looking at uh, responses in face patch AM. So the structure of the talk is essentially the following. Um, trying to get at this essence of what is this visual specialization, first I'm going to talk about uh, basically uh, responses, spiking responses, single unit responses to uh, flash stimuli of different sorts. And I'm going to talk about uh, the way that uh, neurons in the different face patches respond under more natural viewing conditions, such as when the monkey is watching a social uh, dynamic video. So within this first category, I'm going to ask questions like, should neurons in the anterior fundus face patch be considered as face cells? And I'll sort of describe what I mean by that. It's not the most important question in the world, but you'll see why I'm asking it. Um, and then how stable or how plastic are the neural responses in this uh, area over time? The second um, topic, well, I'll, I'll be asking, well, what happens if we take cells that have been now characterized in this way um, and ask what do they do under more natural viewing conditions? How do they respond? And then how similar are the responses of nearby cells in this functionally defined patch? And then finally, and this is the part that I'm, this is kind of the newest and it's not published yet, and it's the part that I'm also personally most excited about is can we try to understand the relationship among cells within a functionally defined region by using whole brain fMRI uh, 
as a readout. And I think particularly here, this may resonate with some of you because it's kind of not that uh, different from some of the things that you're um, playing with. Okay, so if I go to this first topic, um, this is now looking in a more conventional way at responses in this face patch. I have to tell you a little bit about the technology we're using. So we're using chronically implanted microelectrodes. Um, these are invented by uh, Igor Bondar here, who Peter knows. Igor is actually in the lab right now. He's, he's back in. The, it's, yeah. um, and these are basically um, 12 micron wide insulated wires. There's nothing particularly uh, fancy about them, nickel chromium. And you see that they're distributed in a bundle. They're distributed over um, certainly less than a voxel, but about half a millimeter. These are what we're putting into the brain. They have the nice property of being compatible with the scanner, so we can uh, put them in the brain and we can see them in the scanner. And then we can also do fMRI and we can do things like functionally localized uh, placement based upon. Uh, this is, for example, the AF face patch. We show that we hit it uh, with the implantation. And we have a microdrive uh, that David McMahon, uh, he also did a lot of work on this, um, uh, developed, um, and this allows us to advance the, ele the electrodes, um, find cells, and um, isolate them. Now, none of this is particularly remarkable except for the following, which is that once we get cells, and it's a pretty arduous problem to get cells, we can track individual cells for weeks or months at a time. So some property of these small microwires allows us to isolate and maintain the isolation of individual cells. And that allows us to ask new questions. Uh, if the monkey learns something new, if the monkey's trained to do something new, what are the response properties of that cell and how might they change? And then um, in the case that they have a stable set of responses, we can ask a different set of questions, which is, okay, we're normally limited in electrophysiological experiments by how many stimuli we can show during a given session. But if this cell is isolated now for months at a time, we can show many, many more stimuli uh, to investigate the response properties of that cell. Okay, so I was saying something about face cells. Let me just say a little something about what that is, and this is a little historical context for those of you who are not within the field. Um, it was discovered in the late 60s uh, through experiments in an anesthetized monkey in, in Charlie Gross's lab that in addition to things like motion, there were some neurons in the temporal cortex that liked complex uh, shapes. And there was some trepidation about saying about overstating the case. Uh, the earliest um, reference that I could find to a face within the series of papers related to that work came from here, which where the text said, for at least three of the TE units, this is an IT cortex, infratemporal cortex, complex colored patterns, for example, photographs of faces seem to be the most important feature. Um, so I think it seemed so improbable that cells would be selectively tuned for something as high level as a face that um, Gross's lab was, was reluctant to even report on it. But by about 10 years later, um, Dave Parrott had done enough recordings and found similar kinds of results that it became clear that there were indeed neurons in different parts of the infratemporal cortex, for example, here in the superior temporal sulcus, that were selectively responses to faces over other object categories. And more recently, the work of Doris Tsao, now using fMRI-guided placement of electrodes, found that corresponding well with the, with the blobs you get from fMRI, you find that what, what all this shows is just that for a given category of faces is this category here, and these are the other categories in two different monkeys, you can see clearly that the responses to faces are much higher than to the other categories. So you have a categorical set of responses to faces. So as I said, um, AF has really not been investigated in this way much. It's, it shows up in the fMRI, but first we can ask the question, so what are the categorical responses in that area? But we can test a larger image library because, as I said, we can chronically monitor the cell over uh, weeks and months. So let me give you an example of what that experiment looks like. So here's an image library with uh, 250 monkey faces, and we can present these all to the animal, and we can see how the cell responds. For those of you who know about electrophysiology, you may be thinking 250 is not a particularly large number of stimuli to show even within a given session. But this is just a small subset of those that we did show. Um, if, we, if we take the entire um, ar array that we showed to this animal, there were 10 different categories. Each of these, square, these rectangles has 250 stimuli, 10 different categories, uh, four different image sizes, because we basically ran out of images at some point. Um, and uh, each of the colors is uh, representing the response of this particular neuron to that image. So this is um, uh, 
I'm going to ignore some of the features of this. There's obviously lots and lots of information in here, but the, the feature I just want to draw your attention to is the most obvious one, which is that there's a stripe here. And that stripe is indicating that the cell is responding much more strongly to faces, uh, particularly monkey faces, also a bit to human faces than to other image categories. There's also some interesting things having to do with image size going on. Um, but this was pretty typical of what we saw. So this is one cell, um, 10,000 stimuli, eight trials per stimulus. So that's 80,000 trials. That takes a monkey well-trained about 17 days uh, to uh, carry out. Um, but we didn't just have one of these cells. We had 30 of them isolated at the same time. And this is what the population looked like there. So this is now with all of the electrodes in the AF face patch um, for the 17-day period. What you can see is that for nearly all of the cells, you have these stripes in the first and the third um, uh, rows. Uh, in some cases, it's negative. In some cases, it's positive. But those are the distinctive rows. And so um, without really having a really caring much what the result would be, what we find here is that uh, if you ask the question, is this a face cell, or are these face cells within this area, I think you'd have to say that by virtually any definition that there's a face selective categorical responses, the cells in AF are similar to those that have been reported in other face patches, and they are face cells. So that's sort of the starting point, sort of the kind of good news, everything is um, as it should be. I wanted to say, uh, so, so the next question is, how stable or how much do the responses drift over time? Or um, people come at this question with different sets of expectations. So uh, since we can record from the same cell over time, if you establish a certain selectivity, um, is it the case that each evening uh, the, uh, the individual cells are given a different specific uh, response profile, or are, are they steadfast over a long period of time? So, um, well, we, we had done a lot of experiments that sort of address this kind of thing, uh, mostly um, just in the course of asking other questions. But what we keep finding is that there's a real stability over time. Um, and I'll just show you a few slides that give an example of what that means. Um, so this is just a few uh, different stimuli in face patch AF. Um, each one of the blue traces here shows the response over a different day um, for each of those stimuli. If you want to see what that looks like in terms of the rasters, it looks something like this. So on May 21st, each one row here, I know it's a little hard to see, each row is a, a series of action potentials following the presentation of a stimulus. Um, it's more sort of the, you'll get the impression when you see them all together. Here's the first two days. You see that this sort of basic res higher response to these stimuli and lower response to these stimuli is there. Uh, if we play that forward over, I think, uh, a month or a couple weeks in this case, um, you can see that that selectivity is maintained. Okay, this um, is reminiscent of an experiment that uh, uh, ex uh, Igor and I had done back when, when um, Peter was in, in Germany with us um, um, that was published much more recently in a place that's not far away from one of the other phase patches um, where if we present these different stimuli here, we get these pretty well-defined temporal modulations that are selected for the given cell, but you can see that they're stable over a week here. Um, here's a rather different a uh, set of responses for the same stimuli uh, from a different cell in a different period, but they're, again, the point here is only that they're stable over a week or so. So we've had a hard time uh, finding cases where they're not stable. In fact, in extreme cases, we've been able to um, monitor the same cell for over a year. Here's an example of one uh, case in which um, a cell was monitored for 13 months. Um, this stimulus here, for example, elicited this sort of transient response um, from the red, which was in July 2012, um, to blue, which was in August 2013. Um, this is just one stimulus in a much larger array. If I show another a sort of a subset of the array, you get the idea. Um, this cell selected because it, it actually gives a pretty nice variance in terms of its stimulus selectivity. Um, but you can see that while there may be some small differences across days that are a little hard to understand what the basis is, um, the basic selectivity is the same. So we keep noticing this sort of fingerprint of uh, response selectivity uh, that we can actually use very usefully in, in, in the areas that we've recorded from to track whether the cell is the same as the one in the previous day, because we have other kinds of problems like the electrode isolations drift and things like that. So um, in terms of the um, natural drift in the absence of any explicit training, it seems that at least in some parts of the brain, and this is just one voxel, basically. It seems it's at least theoretically possible 
for cells with a very high degree of selectivity to maintain that selectivity for more than a year. Uh, and we have seen very few counterexamples of that. Uh, with having the electrode, we've put them in three or four different places, and we haven't seen a counterexample for that. Um, I'm going to say briefly some efforts we've done to try to push perception, and hopefully maybe that can change um, the um, response profile a bit. And this is part of a different project that I'm really not going to talk about related to norm-based tuning, uh, which we're actively working on right now. But basically, if you were to have um, a monkey who is uh, specialized in recognizing individual identities, an experiment that we've been working with for a long time, sort of a paradigm we've been working with, is this idea of having a face space. Individual monkeys are here in the outer ring. Um, the average of all of these monkeys is here, and you can modulate the identity level as you move from the average face to the individual monkey identities. And you can ask the question, well, if the monkey's trained um, to improve their perception using a training paradigm that looks a bit like this, the details are not that important, but um, on day one, the monkey sees these, cell, these stimuli for the very first time. So you can ask the question, okay, during the first few days, do the neurons change their response when they're sort of incorporating this new thing into their repertoire? And then after a while, the monkey, um, after that familiarization phase, the monkeys then uh, learn this task where they basically have to say, which identity was this? And they have to look to one of four positions on the screen. Um, then after that, then we start the perceptual learning, which is a staircase procedure where we give the monkey lower and lower level identity um, uh, faces, and they have to maintain a constant performance. Um, and then we retest after, uh, after intervals over, of time. Um, it kind of plays out like this. Um, again, the details are not so critical, but the interesting thing here is that after they've learned all this stuff, they've had the familiarization, and then in the perceptual learning phase here with the staircase, they get to uh, lower and lower um, identity levels um, uh, so that to, to maintain a constant level of performance. So we can ask, okay, this has a certain time constant, it has a certain you know, amount of effort, et cetera, et cetera. Can we track cells that may be changing their activity levels or tuning um, in concert with the monkeys is learning over days and weeks. So um, to give you a feel for what that looks like a little bit, um, this, this work was uh, carried out by Adam Jones and David McMahon. Um, if you, uh, the monkey learns, as I showed you, he, he actually learns four faces, but just to make it simple, here are two faces, and then he's shown one that's kind of somewhere closer to the center, and he says, oh, that guy must be that guy. So he moves his eyes over here, and if he does it correctly, he gets reward. So we're training him day in and day out to improve the perceptual performance, um, which does improve, as I showed you. And then we can ask the question, okay, um, what does it look like over this timeline uh, from May to July? Adam spent a summer recording just about every single day uh, during this paradigm. And the results were kind of disappointing, um, but worth, some, worth kind of showing you the raw result, which was that um, as you uh, look over time, the familiarization phase, the, the basic training phase, and then the perceptual learning phase, um, it, it's a little hard to judge, but you have to take more for it. There's no detectable changes in the response profile in any sort that we could use. It's a little boring to show you all those analyses, but it's basically uh, no detectable changes. So the cells, to put it in a more positive way, the cells were steadfast in their sensory specialization without, uh, uh, despite the fact that the monkey's uh, sensitivity to identity was changing during this period. So clearly there are changes happening somewhere in the brain and maybe face patch AF for, despite some evidence, is not involved in this process. Um, but um, that's, that's what we found. I do want to say something about some very new data that's right off the press from, or, well, not off the press, but right, right going on in the lab right now. This is data from Kenji Koyano, who's a new postdoc in the lab. Um, he was asking the same question, not in face patch AF, but in AM, um, focusing only on the first part, which is the familiarization phase. So there have been, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that when you introduce new stimuli, that cells start to become dedicated to those new stimuli. Um, and we were a little surprised we didn't see any evidence for that uh, with quite a bit of looking in face patch AF. But with an AM, we have some initial indications that there might be something like that, and I'll just show you what's really the last couple weeks. Um, so this is, again, um, recording uh, over a few days, um, sort of systematically introducing new stimuli over time. 
and finding, uh, in this case, you can see that like there's a, um, an apparent uh, decline in uh, response for this particular stimulus over the first few days. You never quite know if it's real, if it's not real. Um, but we start to think it's a bit real now. When we look over uh, at this early response, so the early is like between this time window here, uh, we see there's not a whole lot of stuff going on. But there's another feature in here which we didn't even notice when looking at raw at it, but then we looking at the raw data. Um, but then it seems to be a big deal when we look across all of the stimuli that we showed, which was this later uh, time point here in which there's very few spikes shown in the late phase of the response. But over, after a few days, there's some larger um, uh, number of spikes. Um, and if we look across all of the stimuli, we see that there is this categorical difference. This is for human faces compared to these other categories. Um, for this, at least for this one cell. So now we have started seeing in this face patch some what look to be systematic um, changes in uh, neural firing as a function of familiarization of individual stimulus categories. So more on that soon, I hope, but now we're at least in the domain of seeing some plasticity, whereas if I'd given this talk a month ago, I would have said we saw zero. Okay, so um, how stable are the, um, or plastic are the neural responses over weeks? Uh, no changes in AF that we've been able to detect. Um, there are many paradigms which we haven't used, but even with some pretty explicit training. Um, but within AM, with simply um, introducing new stimuli, you start to see changes uh, to those stimuli over time. This has to, of course, interact somehow with the selectivity and other factors, uh, which we hope to investigate in greater detail. Okay, so th that's sort of the, the first part of my talk. I'm, I'm going to change now to the second part, which is more about uh, natural vision and other strategies for getting to this larger set of questions that I uh, talked about. It's worth for a moment reflecting a little bit on how we think about visual processing. And we've had some discussions this morning and early this afternoon that relate to this. Um, there are a number of experimental paradigms and books and theories that shape how most of us think. And we have a lot of same starting points when we want to do brainstorming on what to do next. So the anesthetized preparation where, uh, in case of vision, the eyes are paralyzed, you present stimuli, you identify receptive fields. Uh, in the awake animal, um, you can have the animal perform tasks. Usually it's a fixation task um, involved. If you want to uh, stimulate a particular part of the retina or a receptive field, you have to have the animal fixating very well. Um, these are monumental um, steps forward in our understanding of many aspects of visual function. They have led collectively, combined with some anatomical studies and many other things, to the concept and sort of this acceptance of a cortical hierarchy, where, as we know, um, when a stimulus hits the screen, uh, the retina is stimulated and the magno and parvo of the LGN is stimulated, and vision, visual energy or information ascends through this hierarchy. Um, it ends up in um, distinct dorsal and ventral streams, so a what type paradigm, uh, pathway here and a wear type pathway occupying uh, other areas over here. And there's, th this, is, this is obviously uh, the strength of the field to be able to compile information in a way to come up with theories like that. But I, my point here is a little bit the opposite, which is that if this is the starting point for all of the people thinking about the problem, it's, it's um, a bit limiting when it comes to translating it a little bit more in the direction of natural vision. So what we're trying to do in my lab is to just take a couple of risks, step a little bit outside uh, the normal thing, and see whether we can make some sense in a bit looser paradigm. And I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir here because a lot of you people are, uh, a lot of you, um, your labs are, are doing similar kinds of things. But let me just think about how we're think say how we're thinking about it. Um, if just showing natural movies or having animals interact or something is not particularly insightful. One has to sort of face this uh, trade-off between the kind of controlled environment, uh, such as the case where the monkey's eyes are paralyzed and, they're look and one is presenting uh, very controlled stimuli with, with, with parameters that, that are easy to quantify, versus, say, the other extreme where you have a whole colony of animals and they have all been implanted with thousand electrode devices and telemetric uh, devices so you can monitor activity while they're doing natural social things. Um, I'm generally very comfortable on this side over here, but this is too much for me. I think that particularly, I mean, if you want to study sleep, that's great. If you want to study some kinds of social 
parameters, that might be good. But if you want to study vision and the causality between the, the stimuli in the world and what's happening in the monkey's brain, I think you won't be able to be able to recover that information. So we kind of um, have found ourselves maybe at a position here on this continuum. And for us, that's as simple as just having a monkey uh, watching TV. And the monkey, uh, luckily for us, the monkey very happily watches TV. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we have these five minute videos that uh, Brian Russ in the lab, but Brian was here, maybe many of you know him. Um, he started this project uh, in the lab. Um, we have about uh, 17 um, videos that are five minutes long. And every time a monkey enters the program, he very enthusiastically watches each of them. But if you play the, if you play the same one twice, he'll watch it, look at the things. And after you play it like three or four times, he's like, uh, you know, <laughs> is, there any, is there anything else on? But then we, we make an arrangement. For us, it's important to replay the same videos again and again. Um, so we make an arrangement, and we're like, look, um, just watch the thing, and you get some juice, and just, just look at the screen, OK? And when, when we do that, and then we analyze the eye movements, we sort of come to this middle ground, and he uh, is able to do that, or he or she is able to do that. Um, and they just still do look at the features and stuff. So they really do watch the thing. So that's sort of where we are. Um, for us, as I said, it is important that they watch it multiple times, and I'll explain why that is. So let me give you an idea of, from an fMRI point of view, what it looks like when the monkey is just watching a video. And I'm, this is just a not uh, very detailed thing, but just to show you what it looks like, I'm going to speed the video up quite a bit so you can um, see what's going on. So this is the kind of one of the videos that the monkey watches. And you see here, as the scenes progress, the, this is all sped up again. You see that there's sort of a bubbling of activity in different voxels in the brain. Some of it is co-varying. Some of it is sort of independent. Um, and you start to say, well, there must be something I can do to capture the regularities there. But how do I know that it's going to be the same if you even present the movie the second time? Well, the good news is that if you um, look over multiple runs, and now we're just going to focus on one voxel here in V4, um, what you see is that the response properties, uh, this is now four different, or, or at least four different runs of the same movie. Uh, this is uh, the fMRI signal using myons. We have the advantage in monkeys we can use myon, which increases the signal to noise ratio of the hemodynamic response. Um, you can see they're in very good agreement across runs. So the fact that they're in good agreement gives us one thing to grab onto. It's not only about can we grab the features out of the movie and try to map based upon the features, but now at least we can, we can for example, say, let's just map all the areas that respond the same way uh, when you present the same movie twice. I mean, that's a legitimate way of mapping the brain. And then you can change the movie and say, well, is it the same for all movies? And you can start thinking of, sort of down a different um, direction. Well, I won't go too much into that. I will just say one thing that Brian has done um, related now actually to the stimulus features. He said, well, if uh, within a region of the brain um, you have one time course that looks like this uh, over but is consistent across runs, and then in neighboring regions the time courses uh, appear somewhat different, is it, I mean, clearly they must be responding deterministically to different features of the movie. So is there something we can do to try to uh, determine what that is? So the approach we, we took in one paper that we've published uh, so far is to say, well, um, you have a couple things going on in parallel here. You have the time courses of the voxels, um, but then you also have the events within the movies. So can we go into the movies, extract the important events, and then take these time courses here, um, convolve them with the hemodynamic response and all that, and then compare them to the actual time courses of the movie? So uh, upon doing that, one can say, OK, let's just do a reality check first. If we do that and we take something like faces, can we get back the face patches that we um, first investigated by just showing block designs of faces versus objects? And when Brian did that, we got the rather uh, happy response that, yes, you actually can. So if you uh, look at uh, face patches uh, with block design, which is faces versus objects, you get this Again, countable number of face patches here seen in coronal section. Um, if you do the same thing in the same monkeys, but now completely differently, the monkeys are just watching the movies, but now you've gone through and some poor person has gone through and figured out where all the faces are, and then you map them, um, you can find out that you can recover the face patches in a way that's very uh, reliable. It's not 100%, but the black dotted line here corresponds to the block design face patches from over here. Um, and then you can see for two monkeys that the 
face patches derived from the movies are, are right on top of the of there, with a couple of exceptions. Okay, so that's good news, but it's a little bit where the good news part of the talk ends. Um, so now we can ask, so when you think about what's going on inside of a movie, you have a lot of superimposed information. You have uh, like high level features like faces, you have changes in motion content, you have contrast, you have many things like that. Um, let's see, can we compare the different features and see how they rank against one another? Okay, so what we can do is we can apply a multiple regression and we can evaluate something like the percentage of explained variance by each of the factors. When we do that in the posterior face patch, posterior lateral face patch here, uh, we see that the, there's this green bar here. This green bar is the thing that qualifies this as a face patch. This is a very high signal to noise um, uh, method because we're doing a lot of averaging. Um, anything that is not one of the face patches is really down at zero. So that's about you know, three or four percent of the percent variance explained. But if you look at these other features that are also extracted from the movie, contrast, extre extremities, like body parts, um, and then particularly motion, it's much, uh, motion in particular is much higher. Okay, well, PL is sort of a um, posterior face patch, so maybe it's sensitive to low-level features more than faces. But when we do this across a range of temporal and even frontal face patches, um, what we found was that motion absolutely dominated the percentage of the variance explained. The metabolism, the hemodynamic response, whatever it is, it, the, the motion content of the movie explained it much better. We tried many ways of calculating motion and many ways of calculating face uh, content. Um, so despite being able to match the faces, even within the face patches and also outside the face patches in the ventral stream, motion was the dominant factor. Okay. So that gives us a hint that there's something going on, something more than uh, simple face, say, face detection. Now I want to turn to electrophysiology. So now we're going into the face patches. We're going into the AF face patch in particular. And we want to say, how do these cells that I already told you look like face cells, but they have, like all the other face patches, a response to motion more than other features. What does it look like when you record under more natural viewing conditions? So I'm going to play a small clip of a movie, and I'll do this a few times, and your job is to listen to the cell and try to figure out what the cell is doing. So here, here it goes. It gets, gets dirtier if I keep going on. But, um, so ba basically, I mean, if you're like me, you're like, well, there's something about faces, sort of, but it's also about motion and maybe some biological movements. And, you know, and when you're listening online, you put the headphones on, and it's an auditory experience, and you're listening, and you're like, you know, there's just too much weird stuff here. I'm not 100% sure it's even that much linked to, this, to the movie. Maybe the monkey is scratching his belly or something else is going on. But reassuringly, just like with the fMRI, if you play the same movie multiple times, uh, you get something that looks like this. So this is now playing the same movie 10 times. And I should say that we can only do it so many times because we have these implanted electrodes we can record the next day and the next day and the next day. Um, and what you can see is that there's a very high degree of um, uh, correspondence when the cell is firing, when the cell is not firing across trials. So again, there's an anchor point, something we can grab onto and use uh, for, for the future things. Okay, so let's look at, um, let's look at um, what happens across the population. So um, if we want to say then, how repeatable is this? This is now just another example where there are four trials um, across the population. This is a spike density function over time. Um, if you just take the correlation of those things and you say, okay, all pairwise correlations um, for a given cell, what you find is that the intertrial correlations for is very high, at least for this population of cells. You know, perfect will be 1.0, but there's, you know, changes across trial. But you have this thing. And I'm showing you this because I'm going to contrast it with something else in a few slides. Okay, so the next question is, so that, that was one example cell, and it's a little nor here nor there. Um, it's a little hard to know exactly how it links, but this is a face cell. If you flash stimuli, it's a face cell. But what happens now if you say, okay, if I have 
one cell and then another cell that's still within this bundle, within 500 microns? Are they doing at least kind of similar things when the monkey's watching a movie? So that's shown here, but I'm gonna, you can sort of see the answer already, but I'm gonna show you what it seems like when you're actually listening to the cell. These are two cells recorded simultaneously um, for a given scene within a movie. Um, this is just another random scene from one of the movies. Um, I'm gonna start off here and, and uh, present what the cell is doing for both uh, cases. Okay, so that's the, cell, that's the first cell's response to that segment of the movie. If I then uh, go to the neighboring cell and say, what is that cell doing? At the same scene, it looks like this. So clearly those two cells are doing something very different. Um, if you look across the population of nearby cells, they're not just anti-correlated. That would be easy. It's just a sign change. They're really responding to different features of the movie. So if you take that and you uh, compare it, this is now what I showed you before. This is the intertrial correlation of a given cell, of pulm, uh, given multiple presentations of the same movie. If you look at different cells and how are they responding with respect to one another, uh, one another it's very different. It's a somewhat broad distribution, but the mode of this distribution is at about 0.1. Um, so it's, it's almost uncorrelated. So there are clearly some examples where there's more correlation or less correlation, but this was sort of the starting point for what I think is the, um, the, the newer stuff within the talk. Um, I want to say a couple things about the analysis that David McMahon, who collected these data, um, did on this, um, on, on this work. He wanted to see, for example, might we be able to see what the sort of common modes of responses across the population are if we do a, a PCA uh, reductionality uh, of the, the dimension, um, uh, dimensionality reduction of the time courses. So that's pretty straightforward. If you take the time courses here from multiple different cells and we have a whole population, um, you can say, well, to what extent is the shared variance um, like common throughout, throughout the different cells? You get a plot that looks like this. This is one of the um, scree plots for those of you who know that stuff. Um, so the, the, the important point here um, is that the first principal component is at about 14%. So the, the time course that's shared among the population accounts for about 14% of the explained variance. And if you want to get up to you know, 80%, you have to go through quite a few principal components. So okay, that seems not, that seems consistent with the idea that they're pretty uncorrelated. Uh, what, do we, what if we do something like rank the responses uh, the, res the response time course is according to that first principal component of the first eigenvalue. Uh, if we do that, we get something that looks like this. This is a th published work that David McMahon uh, did in the lab. Um, and you say, well, it seems like there's, um, this is now ranked where the, the heat map is the response, the spiking response profile ranked now in order, as we go down here, of the, the highest uh, first eigenvalue down to the lowest, the highest negative first eigenvalue. And there's not, again, really important information here, but it seems like there are at least some cells that are doing similar things to one another. There's like categories of cells here. Um, there's kind of this mess in here, and then there may be another category down here, although it doesn't really clean itself up very well. And as far as we could go, by just looking at the time courses, this was as far as we could go. So if we want to talk about categories of neurons, it just seemed that they were um, uh, uncorrelated primarily. Uh, one more point on David's analysis, he said, well, what about this first eigenvector where there's the highest amount of uh, shared variance? Does it correlate with anything? And he, he actually found what it, something it correlates very well with, um, which was the size of faces within AF. So this subset of neurons that really did care about faces a lot really cared about the size. So what he did was he computed a uh, measure of on-screen face size and degrees of visual angle, and that's the black here. And then he plotted that versus the first eigenneuron in the green, and that has a correlation coefficient of 0.7 or 5 or 0.8 or something like that. Um, and if you look at the kinds of scenes that it corresponds to down here is when you have distal scenes, and where up here you have close-up scenes. So one thing that we talked about um, is that the AF face patch uh, is distinct from other face patches in that it gets a lot of input from parietal areas. It's also projecting to parahippocampal areas. Maybe it's more concerned with spatial aspects of faces within a scene than some of the other face patches. <laughs>
We're not sure, for example, whether what we see the selectivity for is more related to the, uh, the size of the stimulus on the screen. Again, this is within the experimental paradigm that we all do. Or maybe it's more about the distance that a conspecific would be, because monkeys, in absolute size, monkey faces are always approximately the same size. So going back to the outline, um, what do face cells respond to under these conditions? Well, it's really, it's really hard to say subjectively. You know, we're looking for words to hang on our feature detectors. And the more I do this sort of natural vision stuff, I'm like, eh, I'm not sure that's the right way of thinking about it. Um, there's some, something related to motion. And um, for, at least for that first eigenvector, um, there's uh, scale and distance seems to be uh, very important. If we say how homogeneous are the responses of face patches uh, neurons during natural vision, the answer is that they're really inhomogeneous. Um, there are some features that are shared. But the last part of my talk is really asking, can we do something to try to understand this population diversity a bit better? So to try to do that, we're asking the question, well, at a theoretical level first, why do adjacent levels, or why do adjacent neurons in a face patch respond so differently? Um, so if we have, for example, uh, one cell here that responds with that time course, but consistently over multiple trials. I'm sorry, the battery's gone in this thing. Um, consistently over multiple trials. Um, not sure that's better. And another neuron here that responds in an uncorrelated way, which is the common thing that we see. We can say, well, why is it so different? Well, one general possibility is that, well, maybe that's just what the microcircuit does. It breaks down its input and into components like the hidden layer of a neural network. And what, whatever you see, you can't really hope to understand it because that's the function of a microcircuit. That would be maybe, uh, you could call that the, the, dist the division of labor hypothesis within a microcircuit. Another possibility, and it's actually one that I favor, is that the response differences that we see are really because there are sort of different modes with which, different, with, with which adjacent levels are synchronous in their activity. So studies have shown that, on, for like example, under spontaneous conditions, the membrane potentials tend to fluctuate. And even under active conditions, they tend to fluctuate together. But there can be events that will selectively drive the spiking of one cell um, while leaving the other cell intact. So there may be some selective, strong uh, inputs coming from axons from the deep white matter, for example that will be affecting cell A, but at the same time not affecting cell B. So if, if that has any truth, one might expect that the um, cell that's getting that one set of inputs is going to be correlated its activity with the networks that are somehow related to that one set of parameters, whereas the cell that's getting its input from a different area is going to be correlated with those other set of areas. So the, the, the aim of this part of the talk is to um, see whether we can get some information about that by using whole brain fMRI as a readout, also using the movie stimuli. So the, um, the basic idea is the following. Um, you have all the single units within the face patch, and then you have uh, the monkey also in the scanner. And in both cases, the monkey is watching the same movie. Uh, it can even be different monkeys. I'll show you uh, data today from different monkeys. Um, and the time course, so you have a timeline here associated with the movie that gives you sort of the common currency of comparing uh, the neural signal and the fMRI signal. And so if you go in here, this is sort of scaling up uh, relative to the, SC, the superior temporal sulcus here. This is one voxel. These are the electrodes within a voxel. Um, and then you can say, if you pick uh, a given cell from one of these electrodes here and you compare its time course, to activity throughout the entire brain, what does it look like? So um, you do that, um, just sort of, uh, you, you say, okay, in, in one box in the brain, you get that time course here, and in another box in the brain, you get that time course here, and if you put them together, um, you can say that, okay, here, from this, this is the work of Su Hyun Park. You can say that for this voxel here, which is the purple here, you compare it to this uh, neural time course. For this other purple voxel here, you compare it to the same neural time course. There's a dis different coefficient because they have a different level of correlation. You can use that to make a map, just like you make any fMRI map. Um, when you do that, you find a map that looks something like this. OK, so what do you do with that? Um, well, the idea is that this is now a cell-specific functional map of correlations. And one might conceive of the 
brain responding to the movie as a sort of filter or a, a smart um, dimensionality expansion or transformation of what a single neuron is doing, a readout of what a single neuron is doing. So here's a readout for one such neuron. Um, if we move forward and, and look at a couple neurons, here's an idea of how diverse uh, the neural responses can be. So here's one of the cells um, that gave that time course, another cell, and, it, and if you apply that method to the whole brain, you get a readout that looks like this. This is actually rather similar to what I showed before. It's a different representation. Sorry, it's flipped. But this is the superior temporal sulcus. That cell is uh, showing its responses in the superior temporal sulcus here. I'm going to show it like this from now on. If you look at another cell, you find that its responses are, are rather different. Uh, if you do the same kind of mapping now with the same fMRI data, you find that its responses are uh, much more in the early visual cortex. So this is a cell in a face patch whose time course respond, corresponds to what's going on in the early visual cortex. Um, if you um, look and you, and I just want to remind you that the location of the electrode is here in all cases. So the electrode for all of this stuff is in one spot within the superior temporal sulcus in the AF face patch. So now if we just look only at the fMRI data, we can, this is a little messy and you're like, well, what's blue and what's, what, what should I pay attention to here? And there's a whole big thing about spurious correlations, the time course being long enough and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to get rid of some of that complexity for you now by just saying that this is a, uh, the overall amplitude map of, multi of the average of multiple presentations of the movie. So when we average and average and average and average, then the noisy areas where there's no visual response goes down and down and down and down. Um, and then we can use that as a mask to this other thing which, which suffers from a rather different problem which is a correlational window problem. So it's a little easier to look at here. So now we have um, one cell that gives this and its neighboring cell that gives a rather different functional map. Now, again, I, the, one of the themes has been that adjacent cells um, are very different in their functional um, responses. And that shows up in the way that they um, uh, project onto these maps as well. So um, it's, it's, most, um, it's most extreme when you talk about two cells that are recorded simultaneously from the same electrode, for, of which we have several examples. If we, if we restrict just the discussion to, to pairs of cells recorded simultaneously, um, what we can see are examples like this, where from channel 82, unit A and B have these very different maps, reflecting their different time courses, but also showing how their time courses correlate with specific areas within the brain during the watching of the movie. And if we look at uh, multiple such pairings, we can see that there's really not even uh, a strong agreement in, in most of the uh, uh, single channel um, paired recordings. So now we can ask another question, which is what I'm really getting at, which is can this method um, help us to understand whether there's somehow natural categories of cells in terms of what they respond to? So in order to do that, if we, this is the two examples I showed before. If we take a group of simultaneously recorded cells um, and we say let's only focus in one monkey simultaneously group uh, recorded cells from one population within a half a millimeter, um, what does the population look like? And so it looks something like this. So these are the single unit maps. Each one is derived from one cell uh, across the population. So again, the way I'm thinking about this is it's sort of a way of expanding the dimensionality using a sort of natural transformation that you get because the movie, the monkey in the scanner has seen the same movie. So we know what, this, what the voxels are doing for that same time course. So the question is, can we take that and can we find some sort of natural groups? And if so, what can we do with it? So um, if we, the, the approach that we've taken for this is to, and I'll go quickly through this because I know it's getting late, um, we do a high dimensional clustering on the actual fMRI maps themselves and we look for similarities and whether there's some sort of natural clusters. And um, Su Hyun has found that uh, seven clusters seems to be pretty good. There's no particular rule for this, but it seems to give natural categories. Um, if we kind of um, plot those, you see that one category uh, looks something like this. Um, I put the, the individual members of that category next to it. I'll just go quickly through it. Um, so you, you see that there are um, what we're calling cell groups that have these distinctly different functional profiles um, that are reflecting what the individual cells within that group are doing. Some of the groups are very homogeneous. Uh, some of the groups are a little bit more heterogeneous. 
Um, but that's, where, that's uh, how we are currently conceiving of the different cell populations uh, as assessed through the responses to the movie. So um, I'm going to just quickly show you the flattened version of that so you can see a little bit more detail about what these things are in terms of the specific areas that are um, uh, involved. So if we consider one of these categories here, which is uh, one of these groups here, so cell group five, um, you see these red dots here. Well, these actually correspond very well with the face patches designed uh, with the fMRI block design. And that might have been a guess that you'd have. You say, okay, you're recording from a cell on a face patch, and then what should that correlate with while well, the monkey's watching the movie? Given the other stuff I showed, maybe it should correlate with the other face patches. So for this cell group, nice homogeneous cell group, this is about um, all of the face patches doing the same thing in concert with this subpopulation of cells within AF. Then we can say, well, what about uh, some of the other groups? Well, another one of the groups that was also pretty homogeneous was this, uh, what we're calling cell group three. Um, in this case, you have the face patches again, but now you have the motion areas, the STS motion areas, including MT, F MST, FST, more caudal within the, FS in the STS. Um, and so this is just a different uh, population of cells that, that groups with, uh, with this um, functional map uh, than the other one. So then we look at another one. We say, okay, this is rather different. This is showing negative correlation throughout much of the visual cortex, uh, sparing a little bit foveal V1, um, and also sparing the face patches. And then you look at another example. And so this one shows uh, foveal V1 uh, here uh, with a positive response and a little bit of uh, negative uh, in, in the STS motion areas. So again, these are groups of cells and the face and the patches, uh, the uh, maps that they correspond to. So and just as a last thing, this is not critical, but just uh, two more slides. One is just to give you a gist of linking it back to the features, which is what we really want to do. So now we have these maps. What about the features that those groupings coming from the maps pertain to? So we can look, uh, for example, at uh, some of the features that we pull out of the movie. All of a sudden, now I have the, uh, the pointer. Um, so these are the cell groups here. If I list them all, I'm just going to feature these same four maps that I showed on the previous slide. Um, we see that we can cut using these groupings. We get to things that we can't get to by either just analyzing the time courses alone, which I showed before, or by linking to the features alone, which I'm going to show now. So for example, the grouping within one uh, gives you this pattern of responses. Now, the, the red colors are related to animals um, and bodies. The, these colors here are related to faces these, and motion and spatial frequency and contrast and things like that. So that pattern there gives you, that's this um, flat map. If you look at the flat map corresponding to just the face patches, which is a really sort of categorically different thing when you're thinking about different areas when you look at that and versus that. If you look at the actual features that are responding to that, they're pretty similar, right? So you say, well, th this, this prefers basically the same uh, distribution of features with some small differences to uh, group one. And if you look at some of the other things, they're a little bit understandable. So here you have the flat map where the STS motion areas are involved in addition to the face patches. Well, that one seems to really like motion. That kind of makes sense. And if you look at this other uh, map here, uh, this one is with a foveal V1, shows a positive correlation. Well, that one seems to like high spatial frequencies. So that kind of makes sense, but remember, this is all relative to cells you're recording in the AF face patch. So one more question that may be in the minds of some of you is, okay, what about something a little bit more like normal functional connectivity, where you have a, um, a, a voxel within the AF face patch, what correlates with the voxel or maybe the field potential or something like that. So um, it turns out that if you look at that, um, here is um, for one monkey, um, if you take the fMRI seed voxel in the same position that the electrode was, you get a pattern of activity that includes face patches in some STS area uh, as well. If you look in the other monkey uh, that we use in this study, you see it looks very similar. There's also some frontal stuff. There's a lot of things I'm not talking about. Um, and then you say, well, that's kind of interesting. What, well, what about the field potentials? Well, 
we do actually have the field potentials from that same electrode. Um, and now we can just correlate the time course of the field potentials, and it looks very, very similar. I mean, this is different signal to do the mapping. This is field potentials, this is the voxel, this is from a different monkey, this is from the same monkey, but they look very similar. And if you compare that against the uh, field potentials coming from two different monkeys, you see that it still looks pretty similar. And so you're like, wait a minute, so now there's a whole population of cells that has all this diversity, and now you've shown that the field potentials and the local seed voxel have this particular pattern, and it, and it turns out that it actually matches very well exactly one of the sub-voxel uh, populations of inter individual neurons. And that's the one that responded well to the motion, which kind of links it back to Brian's motion results. So this is the group three single units. Um, this is the one that I showed you, likes the bar of motion, and it, and it has uh, both the face patches here and the STS motion areas. And so it really didn't have to be this way. It doesn't look like this if you just take the average across all the cells. There's, this is really specifically saying that the voxel time course and the gamma range field potential time course and one subpopulation of cells that's a pretty homogeneous group, they're the ones that give the same uh, functional map. It's about 10% of the recorded cells that are contributing to this group. So if I finish up the outline here and say, can the whole brain fMRI readout be used to understand the local diversity of neurons? Um, we can certainly say that single unit mapping uh, reveals distinct functional subgroups. Obviously, there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of understanding it and moving forward with it. I'm not even 100% sure which direction it's going, but I think we can get to it in a way that neither the pure time courses nor the link to the features allows us to go. And we have some traction on what monkey's brain activity is um, what's going on in the monkey's brain during natural viewing. So to conclude, I started by talking about uh, face cells in AF, um, and they certainly deserve the, the name face cell in as much as any of the uh, face cells that have been reported. Um, and if you uh, are able, as we are, to track the cell's responses over time, um, at least in this one or the small number of places we've put the electrodes, the cells are remarkably stable in their responses in, in terms of their selectivity. In natural vision, we can look at face cells and we can see that their responses are maybe not what we'd predict based on the fact that they are categorically responsive to faces and that adjacent cells are very different in their responses. If we um, use whole brain fMRI, um, and we compare the, that signal across the whole brain to individual cells, we can see that there are natural categories that form within a local population, within one half of a millimeter on each side, um, that give in our hands about seven categories, whether, whether that number is important or not, I don't know. Um, and one of those categories, corresponding to about 10% of the cells, is the thing that matches the map you get if you use the local fMRI signal or the gamma range field potential fluctuations, which is associated closely with it. So let me just thank uh, the many people that have contributed. Uh, Brian Russ really started this program and has contributed uh, thoroughly throughout. Um, Su Hyun has done this last thing I was talking about, comparing the um, electrophysiology and fMRI. David McMahon did uh, all of the work, early work with the electrophysiology with the movies, um, also all of the stability work. Igor Bondar, um, who's currently visiting, uh, came up with the uh, electrode bundle and, and Dil has helped us a lot on that. Kenji Kiano and Adam Jones contributed a couple of slides I mentioned, and I thank you very much for your attention. So um, I think the answer is yes, and we're a little lucky because we don't have to deal with one problem here, which is like when you say V1 cells, I'm already thinking, oh boy, then it's going to be so dependent on where the monkey's looking and the receptive field stimulation and all that. Where we're recording from, we don't have to deal with that much at least, so we can ignore that and then we can look at it. So with V1, if you controlled for that, either having the monkey fixate, but then it's kind of not doing the same thing anymore. What, what I think you're really getting at is if you have natural stimuli, are cells doing different things? I'm sure that the answer is to V1. Actually, Barry Richmond has shown a long time ago, if you use sort of a, a basis set and look in V1, they're really rather different. They have 
a small amount of shared variance compared to what you might expect based on their similar orientation. orientation. Uh, since motion is so dominant, are we doomed in, let's say, if, in a fMRI we cannot have this pleasure, you know, of breaking apart the box or, and looking at the subfamilies of neurons, right? So if there is such dominant drivers as motion, we will not see all those minute effects in which correlate maybe with some activity in those authors which we report. So is it really better to stay away from natural stimuli and be with really nicely controlled you know, fixation if we want to investigate those patches? So I love the question because it means you really understood what I was saying. And I don't know the answer. It's a good question because maybe if it's the case that natural vision is uh, that the that there's an inconvenient uh, dominance of the hemodynamic response specifically by the motion stimulus, the motion component of the stimulus, then maybe you have to do me take measures to make sure that doesn't dominate. I don't know the answer. I'm a little, um, uh, I'm, 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 I tend to think, well, maybe there's another way where you can still embrace natural vision without this problem, but, but your question is right on. Yep. Uh, could I add one more? Sure. Yep. Right, so how much of that motion effect is purely just a visual motion or eye movement? Right. So th for that, I have a great answer. Well, first of all, two, I think. Uh, well, I mean, you can judge that. <laughs> but uh, one is um, that because we do so much averaging, the trial-specific components go away. So, okay, if the eye movements are so correlated across trials that they're contributing in the same way, that will be conflated in this whole thing. But any uh, trial different eye movements will uh, cancel out, okay? That but there is also a lot of concordance. Yes, them, that's, right? that's true. So that's, that's, that's a, a key thing. Um, but we have investigated that because we have another uh, study, which I didn't talk about, that's saying, okay, if we dissect this whole complicated thing where the monkey's eyes are moving and the stimulus is evolving and all that into two different things. We can just analyze the reafferent component. The reafferent means the stimulation caused by the monkey's eye movements, the retinal stimulation or just the movie component, which is what I showed here, which is basically the, the stuff that's within the movie. You can extract it from the movie. What does it look like? And uh, so that's kind of a long story, but you get very different brain areas that are responded from those, responding to those two different components of motion. The, the components here are much more related to uh, MT and things like that, whereas the reafferent component is much more related to early visual areas. Um, and so, in any case, uh, So early on, you showed what you thought was somewhat disappointing, that even though the monkeys got better, um, the cells in AF didn't change. They remained stable. And actually, you kind of banked on that stability to be able to do this later analysis, where you continuously showed the video over and over and over again, based on the fact that those neurons are, are remaining stable. So how can you, I guess, adapt what you're able to do in AF to AM? where you're seeing these plastic changes? Yeah, yeah another, another question that shows that you really get it. Um, right, and we're a little worried about that. I, I don't know if we're that worried in AM since all we've seen are some vague familiarity effects, but you know, we're actually worried about something that I didn't talk about, which is just how do you know you have the same stealth? Maybe that's behind some of your question. But if you want to accumulate across multiple days and assume that they're all gonna be the same response, that's also a problem. Um, but, it, you know, so, but if you take that question and you direct it to the prefrontal cortex or some other part of the brain where, or the hippocampus where you're really expecting that there'll be changes, you maybe can't do some of this like longer term, huge number of stimulus type things. things. Can I sort of ask another thing? So I was really interested in what you're talking about in AM because it really reminded me of some work done by Malcolm Brown and mm -hmm. object recognition and so showing that, right. you know, the neural response is defined with familiarity. Right. right. And then so but not longitudinally. That was like trained versus untrained groups of stimuli, yes. Yes. So I guess, uh, yeah, how does the, do you think that they would see the later responses, changes in the, like how you show that there's the, the increase in spikes? In the later response? Yeah. The that they, they would see? What, what do you mean? That they would do see? you think that they would see that as well with the object category, or do you think it's something very specific to like the AI? Oh, I mean, we're, we're talking about a small amount of data here right now. So I, I can tell you about one cell <laughs> that I got to know. Uh, so I, I can't generalize yet, sorry. Okay.
So in all of, basically in all the maps you showed, we, we're seeing also this frontal patch. Right. Have you looked into that? Uh, what is, what are the features that can drive Yeah, yeah so motion, you know, right? <laughs> um, and um, I would have to look at the maps more closely now to give a more detailed response, but that's the one that, and same with subcortical structures. So if you look in the colliculus and the pulvinar, it just seems to be the motion that really dominates. And that's not that surprising. I mean. So there was pretty much that code which you get from that collection of cells from your electrodes, right? I wonder, and each one of them was so not correlated with any other one, right? So could, and there is those two assumptions that either it's input driven or either it's shared responsibility. And you kind of show that it's both, right? That you have those subgroups within this bigger family, right? Did you look at how much of this code, which is multivariate thing, instead of taking just correlations, like each cell at a time, take multivariate um, measure, like there is this MB cough and all this, where you take the pattern and look how the timeline of that pattern correlates with another multivariate pattern. So pretty much you would look at the multi the code itself in relation with decent areas. So you could take maybe voxel, decent voxel, but instead of taking just one cell, you could take the whole family of cells. But preserve the timeline. Preserve the timeline yeah, 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 yeah. and all of them together because there is still lots of components within, right? It's not like mean of them explain yeah. that. Yeah, right? no, that's, that's great. I mean, I you know I've had a number of conversations on this topic today because it's very common. But I I, I think that you know. I think the timeline's our friend, you know, particularly when we're comparing across whatever. But, and, but the idea of computing templates or, or kernels or something and then tracking the relationship between these kernels over time um, and preserving the timeline is, I haven't well, thought of it. We, we haven't done, done any of that. That's very interesting process, yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure if this is the right question to ask, but it seems like what you're saying is that different areas of different patches are doing different things or on the faces themselves different tasks that they face. Is there one area where the, how should I put, that puts the face together completely that all the other face areas would fall out? Do, do, uh, right. right. Um, so so, so the, the, you could have a model where all the face areas depend on getting projection from another's yeah. area. So, so the, the, the best work on that, I think, is done uh, so far from Ning Liu and Leslie Ungerleiter's lab. Um, and there, they're asking a, a straightforward question, which is, I think, related to what you're saying. It's not, it's not with movies or something, but it's like saying if you just present faces and look for face selectivity, if you identify the face patches and then one by one you do bilateral inactivation of the face patches, what depends on what? Yeah. And um, I think, if I remember correctly, that the, the, it's somewhat consistent with the hierarchy of posterior to anterior, and then with there being two maybe different sub-hierarchies where the more medial face patches are depending upon the more posterior medial face patches, the more lateral face patches are dependent upon the more posterior lateral face patches. So there is a, there's a blockade of information if you, if you inactivate the more posterior along those, either of those two hierarchical areas. What that means for perception is a whole other story and I think we just don't have any understanding of that yet. Sorry, I have another question. Um, so you showed us the LFP and the gamma band and how that mapped on to both the fMRI and group three. Have you had time to look at like the beta band and whether that maps onto like subgroup six or some other feature? Yes, um, a bit. Um, so Su Hyun has looked a bit at that and we didn't spend a lot of time on other bands because they were not as deterministically driven across trials. They were more variable and less consistent. There, there may be something there. I, I think actually the, low, the lower bands were nominally anti-correlated with the gamma band, as one might expect. Um, but I think you know, in the middle, like alpha, beta, they're, they're, they tend to be a little bit more variable, if I remember correctly. All right, great questions. All subsequent questions will be outside of 202 uh, while we stack. Thank <laughs> you.